episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another truly fascinating guest today, helping to create a better tomorrow uh, for all of us on many different fronts. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Najat Mukhtar, who is Deputy Director General and Head of the Department of Nuclear Sciences and Applications of the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, the international organization that ultimately seeks to promote the peaceful uses of nuclear energy energy, uh, as well as inhibiting its use for military purposes, including nuclear weapons. Uh, prior to her appointment, Dr. Mukhtar was director of the Division uh, for Asia and the Pacific uh, in the Department of Technical Cooperation uh, from 2012 to 2014, uh, and she was also the section head of the Nutrition and Health-Related Environmental Studies uh, Group Health and uh, Human Health Division at IAE. Uh, from 2010 to 2012, she's the director of science and technology uh, at the Hassan uh, II Academy of Science and Technology in Morocco, where she coordinated the National Strategy on Education and Research. Uh, she worked as a university professor and research director, uh, University Ibn Tufai in Morocco for more than 20 years. And also during that time, uh, she was a technical officer at the agency. Throughout her career, she's contributed to the publication of, uh, of numerous books, uh, including uh, a foreword to the recent uh, Ionizing Radiation in Mankind. Uh, she has published numerous peer-reviewed publications uh, and has worked as a consultant for various organizations at the both national and international level, including uh, the Ministry of Health and Education in Morocco, the, the World Food Program uh, at the United Nations, WHO, UNICEF, the list goes on. Uh, Dr. Mokhtar holds her PhD in nutrition and endocrinology from Laval University in Canada, as a doctorate also in food sciences from the University of Dijon in France, uh, and did her uh, postdoc work actually close by as a Fulbright Fellow at Johns Hopkins uh, University here in the U.S. A lot to talk about, but Dr. Najat Mokhtar, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Very welcome, and thank you for inviting me. It's great having you, um, and I would love to start off, as we typically do, by handing you the floor for a few minutes just to, to further introduce yourself a little bit uh, about where you grew up, when you first developed uh, your interest in STEM, and uh, a bit about this intersection of nutrition, endocrinology, and food sciences. I think that would be a, a great way to get started. Okay, let's start. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I, I was born in Rabat in Morocco and I grew up there, but in a modest community uh, in, the, in Rabat, uh, where there I learned all the modest, but we learned the values, values of being working together uh, to be resilient and, and helping each other. Uh, I think uh, that was also uh, for me, build my personality and also uh, uh, forward uh, looking to the future and and uh, and as I have said, being resilient. That that was very important. I, I studied my uh, first degree, degree, graduated in Rabat at the University Mohammed V in, in Rabat. I studied biology. So why I how I then I was directed to science. You said my interest to STEM. Uh, I, I was good in science, I was good in physics, in mathematics, in biology, and I loved them because I had fantastic teachers. And, and, uh, and uh, also I was good in languages and I was good in Arabic, for example, and my professor in Arabic want, does, did not want me to go in science, he wanted me to go in, in literatures and go to, uh, uh, although I still love the, 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 the literature and, and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the languages as well, French and, and, and English. And, and, but I loved science and I wanted to continue. I did, uh, I graduated in biology and I always was always fascinated by physiology and, and the way that, and particularly by chemistry and the way that these fascinated molecules, they, in, impact the body and impact our way of living and impact our way of thinking and everything. So uh, I was always, uh, I, I liked biochemistry and I had a, a very good professor in physiology, human physiology, and who was also our teacher in endocrinology. And I, I was there when that professor um, uh, defended his thesis and on, on, on 
an endocrinology and and I was like I was telling to myself I want to be like him mm. so this is what we say there the model isn't it and and this is what triggered my interest to continue my studies in this field but it just happened that I I I continued my mass and my master in 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 France in 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 Dijon and also my doctor at that time it, there was no master we had to do this uh, high specialized studies and then we do a doctorate what we called a, a troisième cycle the, the, the doctorate uh, at, the, at the university and uh, at that laboratory we were more looking at the patterns of metabolism mm -hmm. of molecules in different diets either rich in carbohydrates or proteins and we look at the hormones and 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 also in different condition and different temperature so that was the the main interest of my first doctorate and then i finished and came back to morocco as an assistant professor at ibn tafail university but then to move in my career i i learned that i need to do phd studies and i want again to go abroad but i want to experience another other other, other places and it's you know i have also to stop here and say at that time for a woman uh, my age you know i was born uh, in late 15th and and uh, to go and do these long studies that never end and and everybody was why you are doing this you already got a job why you don't stay and 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 why you want to go and for these long studies even my mom at the beginning they didn't want me to go to medical school too long <laughs> and I was the only daughter among four boys, so it was like, yeah, okay, just do whatever you can, get a job and get married, get children. <laughs> but uh, I, I really was passionate about science and uh, I, I got the opportunity to have scholarship and I went to Canada. I, I stayed there for, I think I experienced five winters there. And, and, and in Laval University, but it was a wonderful experience. It's different from, you know, the settings in Morocco or in France, it's another environment, it's another way of doing science, the way of doing research. And I think that forged the personality and the character because it's not only about studying, it's about, uh, it's about meeting people, it's, it's about, uh, you know, giving you the freedom to do, to you are doing your PhD, so, take it and giving you the responsibility. So here again, where I learned that I need, uh, uh, you know, to build confidence and to build, and then I'm given a trust. So I have to fulfill that, that, that responsibility. I enjoyed my, my life in Canada and, and, and we worked a lot on diabetics and obesity. And again, uh, looking at different conditions, physical activity, different diet again, and looking at, at the patterns of hormone and here particularly insulin, but also heart function and the impact of uh, diabetics and obesity on heart function. So this is was the main uh, interest that we did. And uh, I have to come back to Morocco and do and 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 uh, continue uh, my my work at, as professor, full professor at the university. And uh, at that time, and then I got married to to two children, uh, some more responsibilities, mm -hmm. uh, you know, spouse and mother. But uh, I, w I had the chance to have a husband that was also a scientist, and uh, and uh, and so we were working together in the same area. So that that that's in nutshell my career. But it just happened also that I I heard about the Fulbright, and I went again to experience another another uh, environment of, mm -hmm. of work and, and uh, you know at that time I, I was not even speaking English and I knew that you had to get the Fulbright you have to speak English and and I and I learned uh, English during my maternity leave and and I learned and I applied for the Fulbright and and I got it and I and I and I was accepted also at Hopkins so it was fantastic opportunity for me and the, the 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 challenge was what today I took with me nine months boys because I had twins to to for me to uh, and it was a challenging but again you know uh, I continue to believe that this built the character and forged the personality.
because you have to balance between your la family life sure. and and career and science and you have to be passionate about science and like what you are doing and i was just lucky that i found in my way uh, on my way and my uh, career path wonderful people that it just inspired me and 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 they're humble and they're modest but they are wonderful scientists so i learned from them uh, how how to that nothing should stop you if you want to fulfill something that you believe in Absolutely. should i stop here <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that's it. It's, it's a wonderful introduction and a wonderful message. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm sitting here thinking of your journey now, uh, back and forth from Morocco to Canada to here on the East Coast uh, at Hopkins. Uh, I, you know, as I mentioned, I'm up the road a little bit from from uh, from Baltimore here in, in Philadelphia on the East Coast. And um, I, I guess, like most Americans, you know, when I hear IAEA, I, I automatically think of uh, you know, some of the, you know, obviously the work and inspections and nuclear weapons and things. And this nature, know a little bit <laughs> less about uh, the science and, of course, the human health component of what you've been involved in. Walk us through a little bit, if you would, about your Department of Nuclear Sciences and Applications, sort of where the directives come from, uh, how you decide, you know, we're going to work on these health projects versus uh, these thorium uh, reactors or, or, or whatever the hot topics are nowadays. Talk a little about your responsibilities there, if you would. Okay, okay, thank you. You are absolutely right that most of the people, they know the agency through its watchdog role to, uh, you know, to really um, control the misuse of, of nuclear energy and to proliferation. Down. But also to uh, the agency also promote the peaceful use, peaceful, safe and secure uh, nuclear technology for peace and prosperity for people. And this is in the status of the of the of the agency of the uh, of the agency, and um, I'm happy and I'm really fortunate to lead a department that really focus on the peaceful use of nuclear technology, which is the Department of Nuclear Science and Application. And I don't know how much you know about the, of our department. And 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 again, I think most of the people when we tell them that we work on wide range of development areas from human health to industry application mm -hmm. passing by food food and water, etc. They got surprised. But yes, we are offering a technology. And you know, if you think about it, nuclear technology, it's in our daily life. Yeah. You nuclear technology, when you drive and when you wake up in the morning and and you use your telephone to look at your emails or you know, ships there are, are nuclear technology, radiation technology, uh, it's involved in there. When you drive your car, cables of your car, uh, nuclear technology is involved in there. The water pipes, the, the gas pipes, uh, uh, nuclear technology also uh, checks the integrity of these, these pipes and, and also of buildings. So nuclear technology in our daily life, when you go to a doctor and do diagnosis, X-ray or imaging. This is also it's a it's a nuclear technology. Wherever energy and atoms is involved, uh, uh, there is it's it's uh, we are involved in there. And my department covers a, areas from human health, where again here we look at the full spectrum, mm -hmm. from prevention through nutrition, human nutrition, which is my area, and I started there. Uh, and then you have diagnosis, nuclear medicine, imaging, where we because you need that for wide range of diseases from cardiovascular dementia to cancer. Yeah. And then we have radiotherapy, which is one of the of the of the tools to to cure cancer. Mm -hmm. And of course, when we talk about radiation or radiotherapy you need to control the dose, not too much and not too little. Too little. Then we have what we call dosimetry. So here, only on human health, we are tackling this wide spectrum. And, uh, uh, we, in, and we will maybe, if we have time, we can talk about nutrition and how we, we use the technology to really help uh, member states and help also uh, partners to set programs because you need data. And this is what we are good at, is to provide this data. We have joint program with FAO on agriculture. 
And here again, we really look at the food and agriculture. I always say from the fork, from the farm to the fork. Mm -hmm. So we have soil and water program. We have plant crops uh, growth or what we call breeding, uh, where we use the technology to breed for new varieties. Uh, that they are resistant to disease and climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, we have also uh, what we call insect pest control, where we use this with technology of sterile insect, mm. which is environment friendly. You don't use pesticide, you don't use insecticide yep. to yep. control the pest. And, and, and just imagine how important to country like mine or African countries sure. for agriculture and the income to the farmers. We use this technology also to fight mosquito, like tetsi, like uh, dengue fever. And uh, they have also, we have also food safety, the quality of food. Yep. So yep. you see through, throughout the whole spectrum, we're offering the technology. We use the technology also for water management mm. and offering the, the nuclear and stable isotopes. Sometimes the technology is not really through irradiation, but through tracers. Mm. And that's why we use stable isotopes. And here I love this technology where we really look at where is the water, how much is we have there uh, for countries, and how long it will stay, that water, is it replenished or not, and how pure and good is that water. So all this information can be provided through these technologies. So, uh, and, and, and also in industry, I to talked about car and talked about telephone ships and, and in plane and etc. So this is where we're offering the technology in wide range of also applications. Even when we look at the integrity of bridges, you look at the integrity of pipes and you, you use also the technology there. Mm -hmm. And environment, of course, we have marine environment, we have terrestrial environment. We, we use the technology to monitor because you need data. And what is unique in, 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 in at the IEA and particularly in, in my department is we have laboratories. Yep. We are the only UN agency where we are really, we have wide range of laboratories. 12 laboratories, we have three in Monaco and we have eight uh, in Cybersdorf in Austria and one on water here at the uh, headquarters. So. Uh, we have these labs. And what we do uh, in my department, we have scientists, we have experts that they really look at the technology and how to adapt it to the need of member states, particularly development needs. We are talking about SDGs. We are talking about climate change. We are talking about many global issues, how to adapt these technologies to respond to these global issues mm -hmm. and how to transfer them. So we adapt them through research, through R&D activities, and we build the capabilities of R&Ds in institutions, but also we transfer this to the countries, but we just, we, we don't only transfer it, we teach them how to use it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. through training, individual training, group training, we also pro provide equipment and, and we continue, we build networks so that they are, in, they are, they are for sustainability. So uh, uh, this is, in, uh, again, just not a description on what we do in development in, and particularly in peaceful use. Of course, nuclear power, we have entire department of nuclear energy yeah. to help member states that who, when they, when they wish to you to uh, uh, have nuclear nuclear power, we accompany them uh, in 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 safe and peace and, and secure way to how to use this technology uh, for uh, uh, for their power need. And you know you you mentioned uh, global issues and and clearly. Uh, the big global issue in front of us well, the last year, a couple of years has obviously been COVID-19. Uh, your, your group developed this fascinating uh, Zoonotic Disease Integrated Action Initiative, or Zodiac. Um, and as you just pointed out, uh, atoms are very good at killing bacteria and parasites and fungi and viruses. Uh, talk a little bit about your plans here, because obviously, you know, for every COVID, and we've had pandemic folks on the show, there's a lot of other scary things out there. Uh, talk a little bit about the Zodiac Project, if you would. 
If you allow me, before going to Zodiac projects, I want to take you back to the history and the expertise of the eye in this area. Sure, sure. And uh, eye is, this is not the first time that um, eye is, is providing support to its member state on zoonotic disease or animal health in general. Okay. We have animal health program. I forgot to say that with IAFAO, animal health program. Mm -hmm. And uh, through that program, we have built a network of veterinary laboratories. Okay. More than 40 in Africa and 20 in Asia, and now we are building in Latin America and Europe. And through that network, we were responding to the need of member states when we have Ebola, also zoonotic disease, when we had Zika in Latin America, when we had uh, uh, SMERS and, and, and other, 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 other diseases, not to the pandemic size, but they were threatening the economy, but also to be a pandemic. So we helped member states to tackle these issues by providing technical support, building the capabilities in the veterinary laboratories, providing them equipment, training them, uh, and, 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 and supporting them. So, and when COVID-19 came and building on that expertise of 60 years, member states turned again to the IE asking for support. And what is the, and, and we have, I think uh, it's also unique to the agency to have this being agile in responding and quick. So we quickly responded by providing support to more than 130 member states uh, in a big project, more than, uh, uh, I think, 30 million. Uh, and, and this is one of the biggest action that the agency has ever undertaken to support member states on this. So we, we supported these countries by immediately providing them uh, uh, analytical te tests like uh, RT-PCR, tests with the regions, with uh, uh, safety cabinets, with the training support. Even we cannot, we could not travel at that time. We did it virtually. And we provided also support to the member states uh, beside that to even through in human health. Because remember, everything stopped. You cannot even have a, a, a diagnostic people working properly because you don't know how to do this. So we were supporting imaging prof health professionals to tackle the issue as well. So uh, building, building on the COVID-19, our director general, who is very visionary, he said, we, it's not going to stop here. We need to continue this. So building on the, what we have done in COVID-19, we, we DG initiated this big initiative, as you said, uh, Zodiac, the Zodiac project, which exactly uh, aim at continuing the, con the COVID-19 support, but it's in a more systematic way. Mm -hmm. More, uh, uh, okay, uh, how we can help members say those that they don't have the capacity to be able to detect and, uh, uh, pathogens on time, and monitor them, how we can support them. And within, again, the framework and the mandate of the agency, because, you know, RT-PCR originally was a nuclear technology. So it's evolved now to become uh, non-nuclear, but because the origin was, uh, uh, we had to, to, to do it at the beginning to develop the technology, and then it evolves technically to be non-nuclear. So that's why we continue to provide RT-PCR and develop new, art, new technologies. And Zodiac it has, has several pillars. One of the pillars is building the capacity building among member states. Mm -hmm. And we have now 130 Zodiac national laboratories. They are all veterinary laboratories. Okay. And, the, and we all eval we have evaluated them through uh, the questionnaire. We assessed their need in terms of human capacity and in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure. It's totally extra budgetary, so we are calling for funding to support mm -hmm. us in this endeavor. And we have already uh, pro uh, supported more than 25 laboratories. We are now uh, going on with the procurement. We are now also uh, uh, continuing with the, the training for these laboratories. And uh, we also, uh, we need to, if we did not um, 
stop COVID because something was missing in, in, in research and we, we were not able to detect it early enough. Mm -hmm. So what we are also uh, aiming at and the Zodiac is to do R&D activities, how we can do better, how we can detect better, how we can sample properly, how we can analyze properly, how we can develop easy tools, particularly for low, low income countries, how we can report on that and how we can share, how we can do the networking. So this is one aspect. Mm -hmm. Another aspect of Zodiac is on human health because COVID-19 is not a, norm, a simple flu. It has complications. And we realize that uh, we don't understand everybody has react to COVID-19 differently and we can look around us. So one uh, idea came is we can use medical imaging uh, for COVID-19 mm -hmm. and collect this data as big data and use artificial intelligence to understand the patterns of COVID-19 in the body, taking into account different facts of gender, medical history, etc., etc. How we can, if someone comes with COVID-19 and we can describe it immediately, it fits in one of the models we can immediately react to that person and and by doing so we can save life so this is the way that we want to use also imaging data uh, to help understanding particularly in the case of covid-19 outstanding so i stop here if you have any question related to zodiac yeah no that, that was uh, that, that was a wonderful overview i, I was i was after i read through it i, I didn't realize the extent uh, of all of those components and the breadth of of the different labs that you have out there working on the problem so <laughs> I, that, that was an amazing overview so but thank you for that we're, the, we're doing this with partnership with uh -huh. other organization of course fao is our sister organization sure. we have a program together we are now discussing with the the, uh, the animal uh, health organization the oe we're okay. discussing with who we are discussing with other institutions as we speak today. Our director general is signing uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Institute Pasteur in Senegal mm. uh, to, uh, on, on Zodiac. So, so it's we can't do things alone. We are offering the technology, but we need to do it with partners. Uh, we need to complement each other. And, and, and I think, uh, as I told you, uh, learning what I learned from my childhood, doing things together, it's, it's more impactful than doing, than doing it alone. Surely, surely. <laughs> um, continuing along uh, the, uh, the global issues and, and, and staying on health for a moment, um, you know, obviously another major uh, issue out there is this, this imbalance, we'll call it, between sort of calories and nutrition uh, all around the world. Um, I, you know, I, I took a, the opportunity to look at some of your, your papers from back in the day at uh, Ibn Tufai, and, and you, you had published on uh, diet and culture and obesity in Northern Africa, but at the same time you were publishing on uh, vitamin deficiencies. Um, talk a little bit about uh, this study that's going on at IAE uh, entitled Daily Energy Expenditure Through Human Life Course and, and the purpose of this particular study, which is rather fascinating. It's an interesting paper and I'm amazed that you find out that paper and you looked at it. And uh, I think it's uh, another paradigm shift because uh, we were always saying that we burn calories depends on our... Uh, uh, either gender or uh, this, the, 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 our physiological status, sort of like aged or we are menopause or pregnant, et cetera, et cetera. And this study that used a technology that we call doubly labeled water technology, where we use actually deuterium and oxygen 18 to mm -hmm. look at the energy expenditure, uh, how much calories you would you would you would burn and but and then we calculate after that how much calories you would need and and based on that it's funny that we actually we our metabolism has four phases okay and this is the first time that we are this this is a finding i think that used more than 7000 data from i don't remember how many countries and this is a database that the IAEA is the custodian of this database. And it shows that 
uh, up to one year, the metabolism is the highest. Mm. And it's about 50% higher than for adults. Can you imagine? Yeah. So that means we really, at, 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 uh, up to one year of age, we burn a lot of calories and we need also a lot of energy. And it's just normal because the whole body is growing, sure. organs sure. are growing. And then from one year to 20 years of, of age, the metabolism slow down by almost 30% each year. So it starts going down from one year to 20. So this is the second phase. And then the third phase is from 20 to 60 years, where the metabolism stays stable. Mm. Whatever your physiological condition, gender, it stays stable, no changes. The, your needs are stable and you also, uh, you, uh, your, the, your expenditure is also stable. And then after 60 years of age, the metabolism starts slowing down by 1% each year, very slowly, 1% okay. every year. So this has never been uh, documented, and this is the first time uh, that we are, and this will jeopardize the, the it's not jeopardize, and it's paradigm shift, and will affect the influence, the requirement, sure. and sure. also the, 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 the interventions and the programs for particularly when we deal with obesity and requirement for adolescent, for example, does not change from one year to 20. Mm. So we are not, uh, before our thought, adolescent needs more energy. And uh, so, so that you understand why this, this paper is very sure. important. Sure. Absolutely. And there is another publication also on physical activity, also showing that, you know, if you want to lose weight, it's not through physical activity. Mm -hmm. Physical activity is more uh, to maintain your your fit and 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 in good uh, good shape. But uh, if you want to lose weight, you need to look at the diet. Yep. yep. Interesting. And, and and yeah, being done at IAEA is equally interesting. I think that you know, it's just a, exactly it's coming from IAEA. Yes, yeah, it's no. <laughs> yeah. Um, continuing uh, along, you know, the portfolio and and the, and the different work is being done in your department. Um, another report that you recently put out was entitled uh, "Solutions for Climate Change: IAEA and COP26." Um, obviously, the 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 climate change summit just ended but clearly you know, here we have a, a source of energy it's carbon free um just can you talk a little bit about uh your work generally in climate uh action were you at cop 26 and, and sort of what were the where does nuclear sit nowadays in the discussion? Because usually, I, I once again, when I'm watching on TV, we hear about the windmills, we hear about solar panels. I say, TV, where's nuclear <laughs> in all this? We uh, talk a little bit yeah. about what's happening. Good question. I think we're getting there. Uh, uh, nuclear this time and in Glasgow was on the table, was okay. discussed, and, and uh, uh, we had a big team led by our director general, who was also interviewed in several uh, with several journalists and it was podcast as well and so and I believe that uh, nuclear is part of the solution if we want carbon neutral uh, with deadline that we are fixing it, it, it has it's part of the solution and we need to be open and discuss it and consider what what are the drawbacks and what are the advantages and and and, and we are here to assist and and as you know, now the, the nuclear energy provides 10% of the world's electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we, we, there are member states that they are asking to uh, ask our support because they are the intent to to move towards nuclear uh, nuclear nuclear power, and we are helping them. But in uh, in uh, in the adaptation and the resilience, which my department deals with. We have many uh, opportunities. We have many uh, solutions and opportunities to offer. And I and I started. I told you with the uh, with agriculture. Yep. And uh, we we had a session just last Saturday, if I'm not mistaken, where our my colleagues were showing how uh, plant breeding, for example, when 
you just provide to the seeds a, a just small irradiation, very safe, that create a mutation and you will mutate all the time, just we sure. mutate with sure. longer period. Here, when you provide this small uh, in, this uh, uh, energy, you uh, you create immediate mutations and and by doing so you have varieties so that varieties can be beneficial or not but then we have to screen these varieties and we can do this in several many ways but by doing so we can breed and develop crops that they are mm -hmm. resistant to diseases for example and just uh, just to sit and cite an example uh, in Latin American member state, they are asking our support because now there is this virus. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the, uh, what we call kind of crust in bananas that destroy the whole uh, banana cultures, and and they are asking support to the to to breed for new varieties of bananas that they are resistant to this disease, what we call TR4, and we have done it in Asia and now it appears in Latin America. So we are providing, we are bringing the technology that we have teached or taught to the Asian institutions now, they are, we are bringing it to Latin America so that they, they breed this variety and have a, this, uh, a crop that resistant to disease. And I think the displacement of diseases globally is also due to climate change. Mm -hmm. We see new varieties of diseases. Uh, we use as well... Uh, stable isotope technology to look at, to monitor nutrients so that we don't use a lot of fertilizers and and also uh, we monitor water and we also develop new varieties of crops that they need less water and there is less for less fertilizer so that's very important that's only one example that i'm giving and we have so many uh, similarly we use uh, sterile insect technique that I, I, I just mentioned mm -hmm. to you at the beginning, where we st sterile the male insect so there is no offspring. Mm. And this is how we depress the population of pests. And, we, and, and this has been done in Latin America and billions of dollars has been uh, generated from this. And you don't need to use pesticide or in 60 sites, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in this case. Uh, 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 just to name a few, I, I talked about plant breeding, I, and I can also name water. Uh, I, I explained to you how we can, water now became more and more, and more uh, sca 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 the scarcity of water, yep. particularly in yep. Africa region. And by using this technology, we can tell to the member states and to the countries this water is old of more than thousand years, mm. which means it's deep. It has not been replenished. If you use it, it might not be renewed. So it's better to use this water with, uh, uh, you have manage it better. So, and, and also we, we, we also help member states to look where is the water as well, because mm -hmm. sometimes, uh, Farmers, they are displaced and, and and with their animals. So if we help them finding where is the water and manage it, that's, I think, it's a good solution to climate change. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's, it's fascinating hearing about all, all of these um, components of the portfolio. Um, it, you know, we've, we've talked about human health. Uh, but now, you know, I was talking about the, what we'll call the blue economy and, and the water. We have blue the, economy, the exactly. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the use of, you know, the blue carbon. We know that the nature, particularly coastal areas uh, like mangrove and uh, they, 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 can, they can capture CO2 mm -hmm. and, 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 and store it. And we can, and using, by labeling carbon, you can date how many years that carbon is, lay, is, is stored there and how much of that carbon is stored in that place. Mm -hmm. You can give indication that you don't need to, to preserve the nature. Uh, so we need to provide data. And this is what we call blue carbon. Similarly, in, 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 in oceans, yep. capturing CO2, we can monitor that. 
and even ocean acidity, we can monitor that as well. So we have a huge program on an ocean acidification and also uh, blue carbon on the CO2, uh, uh, how we call this, uh, capturing CO2 mm -hmm. and, and, and preserve it in the, in the soil, particularly in the coastal area. Very exciting programs, very exciting. <laughs> Um, Dr. Have Mark, yeah. you know, while I have you, I, I, I know that you, we're, we're coming up to, uh, to a schedule stop here for you, but before I let you go, I, I'd love to come back to you now. Um, you know, you, you took us on this wonderful journey through what you're doing now and obviously your early career. Uh, you know, you've been involved in academia, industry, government, non-governmental organizations. Uh, talk about, say a couple, uh, for a couple of minutes while we still have you, uh, some of the important mentors, the influencers that have, have guided you along this path that have kept you, uh, obviously you can probably shout out to a thousand people, but, but take a little time just to, to mention people that you might want to, uh, that have really kept, uh, yeah. kept you on these That's paths. Funny. Yeah. Uh, before going to the mentoring question, if you allow me, I want to go back to the question before, because sure. I did not talk about it. A, a, a fantastic and fascinating initiative okay. uh, that we are starting, which is the the what we call Nutec Plastic. Okay. You know, plastic okay. is, a, uh, is a, a huge issue, global right. issue, and, and I think if we don't do anything, I think 2050 apparently we'll have more plastic than fish. Mm. So, so it's uh, uh, so what's, what the you know that we can use radiation technology to recycle plastic. Okay, I know that. Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, we can use radiation technology to, uh, to, if we integrate radiation, we put an accelerator, uh, ion, acce ion beam accelerator in the value chain. If the, the country has a program or strategy and you radiate the, 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 the plastic, it changes the structure of the plastic and it can be reused to other parts and substances and other products. Mm for example, amalgam to concrete or used to produce other products. Or if you want to recycle it completely, you will use less chemical and less energy because that plastic is already has been, the structure has been already changed. Mm. So this is in the upstream part. And in the marine part, we can, we can trace and quantify microplastic using isotope ah. technology so we can so we can you, this is what you call the upstream and downstream part uh, uh, and, and plastic uh, uh, control we can help member states really uh, using the technology to recycle plastic contribute to the recycling but also to monitor the plastic in the oceans mm. isn't it fascinating that's cool. very cool cool <laughs> i call it cool 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 uh, initiative and okay, now going back to the mentoring aspect, you know, I have, if I came to this level, I think it's thanks to my mentors. My first one was my grandma. Mm. And, uh, you know, because um, I, my, particularly my mom was working, so we stayed with my grandma, I was the only daughter. And she's always telling me that you should be strong, you should stand for what you believe and, 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 defend, and defend yourself if you believe in, you some, in something. If you want to study, if you want to, to speak up, just do it because you believe in it and say it. Mm. And I think that's something that uh, I kept throughout my, my career and my life. So uh, she, she also... Uh, yeah, believe or believe in also in me and believing in what I can do. And yes, you can do it. You want to continue, you want to study, you want to go to the university. Because at that time, you know, uh, we, we are not very encouraged. Women were not very encouraged to do higher studies. We can go to after the high school, you can do a teacher or a mm -hmm. nurse. But higher higher studies was for you need to go to get married and then have children. <laughs> so my grandmother was no. If you want to continue your studies, go and and do it because you believe in you and you 
and this is what you want to do and contribute to something that you believe in. I always believed in science and until now I think that SDGs will not reach them if we don't use technology. Sure. Sure. And again, my other mentors were my teachers, my science teachers. And, and they, 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 they saw how passionate I was and how I liked science and they just accompanied me and 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 when and when I find it hard like physics or maths they, they are there for me to explain to me and, and 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 this is fantastic and that's key for the youth to enroll in science we need to yeah. empower yeah. teachers we need to tell them be patient with kids and help them to to love science because otherwise they will go for something else yeah easy which actually is not easy but they think it's easy but right. for me finance is not easy <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, yeah so i i think that's that's another message and and again when i want to continue to my doctorate and and my phd i found people that they said uh, mentored me also to tell me well uh, if because going uh, did I did all my studies in Morocco and it's the first time I'm going to France and I don't have the support of my family because they believe that why I should go because I can work immediately. Uh, I have this person, this French teacher that she was uh, at the same university. She was a professor and he was telling me, I will help you find in a scholarship. I will help you how to find a, a laboratory in France to to have you a student, uh, even she helped me to f when I, when I was accepted to find a, a, a lodging and and so that's wonderful to, to that you have somebody. She's a she's a pro university professor. She's there, and I was looking at her as a model. I want to be like her, and she was helping me how to be like her. And again to the PhD when I saw this professor defending his thesis, that was my model. I want to be like that. Uh, but I think it's not only wanting is to have an objective and have a plan to to reach that objective because yeah. having a, a goals without having plans is just a wish, isn't it? But uh, but having a goal and have a plan how to do it, also the plan is very hard. Uh, you need to reach out to the people that you think that they will help you as well. I think it's uh, we need to reach out to our mentors and show that we are that we have the willingness to do something so they can they can accompany us. And even here at the agency, uh, I have I was lucky to have colleagues that the when I came to agency I didn't even know what the agency is doing apart from the little part that I know about it my field, which is human nutrition mm -hmm. and public health. But I didn't know that the agency has program on water, has program on a new nuclear power, of course, but nothing else on in industry, on agriculture. And and I had this, uh, uh, my colleagues that they accompany me and explain to me uh, what they are doing and, and, and how wonderful is this agency. And the chances that I can have to also go up in my career. So I, I was always mentored throughout my career, but I have also this openness to to show that I want to do more and go up. It's not easy. Sure. It's not easy because you need to compete, you need to prepare, you need to get out of from your comfort zone mm. and be able to, I mean, I wouldn't say fight, but yes, be able to, you know, uh, Going to Canada when my first day was minus 25, it's not a, I, I could just go back in the next week and go back to more warmer <laughs> area. Or going to Johns Hopkins with two boys, nine months, it's not easy. But I just took this decision because I want to explore other, 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 other parts. Mm -hmm. So I think there are mentors, but we need also to be able to take the risk. They can't. Uh, accompanying us all the all the way. I stop here. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and I think if you did try to go home uh, to Morocco, Canada, I think your grandmother would have probably had something to say to you. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, so then just go back. Yeah.
<laughs> um, Dr. Mokta, this has been a, a fascinating journey that you've taken us on, not just obviously your career, but everything that's going on at the agency. And, and just really wishing you the best with, with all of this moving it forward. Um, and for everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode uh, on the podcast or watching uh, on the YouTube channel, you've been listening to Dr. Najat Mokhtar, Deputy Director General and Head of the Department of Nuclear Sciences and Applications at the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, Dr. Mukhtar, I just want to thank you again for taking the time out of your schedule. Thank you for everything you're doing. And as we say on this show, thank you for creating a better tomorrow for all of us via what you're doing. Absolutely. And thank you. Thank you for listening to me. And I'll be happy to answer any questions maybe for those that are listening to us. And, and I think uh, we are doing our part for a better world and better life to, for, for the environment and for the people. And each one of us should do its part. Thank you very much.